have you ever tried to learn the Arabic language? If so, there must be some features that made you raise your eyebrows more than once. Obviously, I'm saying this knowing that the Arabic language has a very precise lexicon and very rigorous grammar. Consequently and reasonably so, you'll understand that this video is made for entertainment purposes and that it's entirely based on my own observations and there is only a fine line between love and hate, so I'll make sure to read your comments accordingly. Ah, numbers in Arabic. And yes, I already know what you're going to say. Aren't you a native speaker of French? Yes, I am. And you're probably thinking, is there in this world a language with funkier numbers than French? Well, apparently there is. <laughs> in Arabic, all numbers from 0 to 10 behave like in any other language. So 1, 2, 3, 4, blah, blah, is 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Starting from 11, like Dutch or Old English, instead of starting with the tens and then saying the units, you will say the units first and pronounce the tens afterwards. For instance, 12 is 12. So you start with the units and then you pronounce the 10. The funny parts start when you combine numbers with nouns. In most languages, numbers are invariable. And when they are combined with nouns, as long as singular and plural forms exist, obviously there is some sort of agreement in number. In most European languages, including French and English, the agreement in number will take the form of an S, at least in most cases. In Arabic, however, even if singular, plural, and even dual forms exist, it's not that simple. Because, dear friend, in Arabic, both numbers and nouns agree, but they don't agree as you might think. They actually often take opposite gender forms. Yes, 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 yes. This is already funky, but the funkier is that, well, the rules depend on which number you're using. <laughs> yes, from three to ten, numbers will take the gender opposite to the word that is counted when it is in the singular. Obviously, said like this, it doesn't really make any sense. So let's check an example. Table in Arabic is tawila. As you can see, it ends with ta marbuta, which is usually the sign of a singular feminine word. So if you want to say three tables, you're going to say thalath tawilat. Thalath is masculine, while tawilat is feminine. Same goes with masculine words. Let's take the word chair, kursi. In Arabic. If you want to say three chairs, you're going to say karasi. And here thalatha is feminine. Why? Because kursi is masculine in the singular. Why? I have no idea. If you think this is weird, then brace yourselves for more. <laughs> Let's take 11 and 12. They both behave in the same way. Let's imagine that we are very rich and we want to say that we bought 11 houses. You're going to say istereit ahadashar baitin. I'm not going to discuss the diacritics here because it's part of the grammar, but let's just focus on numbers. Bait here means house, and it's a masculine word. Ahadashar is also masculine. So here we see an agreement in gender. But obviously, this is not the funky part in the sentence. The funky part is bait, because I told you that bait means house. It doesn't mean houses. Houses in Arabic is buyut. So this means that in the sentence, even though the meaning is plural, the word remains in the singular. This is funky, right? Well, the funkier is that from 13 to 19, it's yet another rule. From 13 to 19, for some reason unexplained, the tens agree in gender, while the units take the gender opposite to the word, which itself remains in the singular. So if you're even richer and you want to say that you bought 13 houses, you're going to say So here the ten agrees in gender with bait, which is masculine, while is feminine, so it's the gender opposite to the word bait, which itself remains in the singular. Isn't it fantastic? As a native speaker of French, I totally understand when people say that <laughs> French numbers are messed up. But come on, man, how f 
is this? I'm gonna stop here with the numbers, but I only want you to know that it's only the tip of the iceberg. By now, you know that Arabic has both feminine and masculine. And to be fair, most of the time, it's quite easy to determine whether a word is feminine or masculine, depending on its ending. As a general rule, when you start learning Arabic, you're told that ta marbuta indicates a feminine singular word. And indeed, this applies in most cases. Actually, I would even say that in Arabic there is no other letter that screams femininity more than tamarbuta. But then you stumble on names like Hamza or Usama, which are undoubtedly masculine names. In shock, you ask your ustad, your teacher, why the heck is this? And when you thought it couldn't get any weirder, you see your beloved ustad transform into a setida in the plural. But wait, didn't you just say that tamarbuta indicates a feminine singular? That's exactly what I said. I see you're following the conversation. So does that mean that ustad suddenly becomes feminine and singular while it's plural? Nope, it looks like it, but it's actually masculine and plural. And what would a teacher be without his students, his talaba, which is the masculine plural form of talib, despite looking otherwise? It's fun, right? Arabic also has a very interesting relation with adjectives. You see, in Arabic, the plural form of nouns referring to things or to objects is regarded as singular and feminine, even if the noun was originally masculine. And the adjective will agree accordingly. Let's say you want to say a beautiful house. As I said earlier, house in Arabic is bait, and it's a masculine word. So you're going to say beitun jemilun, a beautiful house. In the plural, you're gonna say buyutun jamila, where jamila is singular and feminine, because buyut is regarded as feminine and singular. So the whole expression grammatically is singular and feminine, despite being plural in its meaning. Arabic pronunciation is regarded as extremely important, especially if you're reading the Quran which is written in formal Arabic. So we can say there is a general consensus when it comes to the pronunciation of modern standard Arabic, maybe with the exception of Tunisians who have apparently decided they will pronounce the letter da however they are pleased. But this only applies to modern standard Arabic, aka fusha. When you step out of the fusha zone, Arabs have gone pretty much freestyle. This is where learning Arabic pronunciation becomes extremely easy for foreigners. Well, at least that would have been the case had the Arabs agreed on how they would mispronounce the letters. Many people struggle with the pronunciation of the letter Qaf, which appears in the word Qalb, which is not the word Kelb, as you might have heard. The great thing is that in Egyptian Arabic, as well as in the Levantine dialects, so the dialects spoken in Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, as well as Jordan, they do not pronounce the Qaf. They replace it with nothing. So if you listen to Arabic songs, you might already have heard Elbi, my heart, which stands for Qalbi in modern standard Arabic. But, 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 because obviously there is a but. Arabs have not simplified letter of the same way. In the Gulf states, for instance, they often replace of with ga, which is also easier to pronounce. So you will say galbi instead of qalbi. However, if you cross the Red Sea direction Cairo, you might get confused yet again. Because when you hear an Egyptian say gamil to you, it doesn't mean qamil or gmail as Hajj Google apparently believes. It means jamil, beautiful. But wait, haven't you just said that ga replaces qaf? Well, not in Egyptian and Sudanese Arabic where the g sound replaces the j sound. It's quite a mess, isn't it? Well, I hope this video made you want to learn the Arabic Arabic language because it's real fun. Thank you for watching for Arabic natives. If you have any funky explanations regarding the seemingly nonsensical aspects of the language, hit me, but gently, in the comments. Bye!